Articles of Faith is a weekly interview show featuring scholars and writers who have written about the doctrines and teachings of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Articles of Faith is a production of Fair Mormon and is hosted by Nick Galletti. Ralph C. Hancock earned his bachelor's from Brigham Young University and his master's and PhD from Harvard University, all in political science. Prior to joining the faculty at Brigham Young University, where he is now a professor of political science, he taught at Hillsdale College in Michigan and University of Idaho, amongst others. Ralph Hancock is also one of the founders of the LDS web journal Square2 at square2.org and a member of its editorial board. His current focus is on meaning and the limits of philosophy in relation to politics, ethics, and religion, and has started a series of articles with Meridian Magazine. He is here today to talk about an introductory article that introduces a series with Meridian Magazine entitled, An Invitation to Help Advance the Pursuit of Truth as it Concerns Our Way of Life. Welcome, Ralph Hancock. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you are not a new voice in the dialogue and effort to defend the LDS faith online. You've, you've been doing this kind of for some time from my research. So this effort with Meridian Magazine starts about, about how many years deep into your online efforts? Well, my online efforts, uh, uh, the years fly by, you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I, I thought uh, actually my, my efforts go back pre-online, and there is an, an interesting connection with Meridian, but the, the first time I ventured to, to employ my philosophical background in a specifically Mormon arena was probably an article that's close to 25 years old called, uh, What is a Mormon Intellectual? Mm. And that was in the context of roughly the time of the now much famed uh, September 6th, you know, an earlier yes. time of uh, commotion in the church uh, regarding dissidents, who some of whom were in trouble with the church. So an important theme grabbed me, and I thought it important to share this clarification of the word intellectual. We can come back to that, but the reason it's connected is that uh, uh, the publisher was Maureen Proctor, who then published a popular Mormon Utah magazine called This People. Mm. And uh, this is how my views got some uh, some play back at that time, twenty or more years ago. So I've had uh, not an not an ongoing, but an intermittent and uh, very uh, trusting, productive relationship with uh, with the Proctors, who published Meridian, who published Meridian magazine, going back uh, to those days. Uh, the question, "What is a Mormon intellectual?" arose because, as I believe I say at the beginning of the article. We kept hearing from every media source, uh, especially, but not only in Utah, the Salt Lake Tribune, of course, uh, that there was this problem with Mormon intellectuals. Uh, and it got to the point where checking in with my mother on the phone one day, she was in the Seattle area back then, uh, she expressed her concern. Ralph, she said, I've heard that Mormon intellectuals are in trouble. She was worried about me because she assumed that, you know, I was a <laughs> professor. Yeah. I studied political philosophy in graduate school. I must be in trouble. And it struck me that it might be useful to parse uh, what is at stake in the term intellectual and how it's used. And I suppose ever since, in one way or another, somewhat intermittently, but <laughs> somewhat compulsively too, since it seems I can't let it go, <laughs> I've... Uh, I've been trying to explain why being a thoughtful, critical thinker who is a Latter-day Saint uh, doesn't necessarily cast one as a Mormon intellectual, as that term is normally used sure. in the press and so forth. So at the beginning of your article, uh, you, you would introduce or reference Elder Bednar's recent address at BYU Education Week about flooding the earth with messages online. Uh, his messages specifically mentioned social media, but it, of course, includes the other references from other apostles about being a positive voice online and things like that. So what was your response to hearing Elder Bednar share that, being a person that has had some history and in, in sharing things online? Well, Elder, Elder Bednar's message was an encouragement to me in a way to keep doing some things I'd been trying to do and to do them better. 
and with certain concerns in mind. But let, let me say that every other day at least, I am tempted to put aside uh, this, uh, you could say, skirmishing with, with Mormon intellectuals or those who want to uh, interpret Mormonism to make it compatible with certain moral and political or ideological trends that they find attractive or irresistible. Almost every other day, I'm uh, tempted to put this aside because uh, I don't need it for myself personally. It, it's not, uh, I, I'm not uh, a professional Mormon studies person, for example. I, I have um, interests in political philosophy and its his history. My uh, academic publications uh, don't generally touch directly on Latter-day Saint things. Uh, and uh, I have projects that, uh, that please me and satisfy me, whether or not they reach a wide audience. Um, I have uh, philosophical projects concerning grace, nature, and politics, for example, in the history of thought, that I'd be very happy to pursue it uh, more constantly. Uh, so I would be happy to put aside these little attempts of mine to call attention to potential derailments of uh, Mormon intellectual life that seemed to keep uh, popping up. And when I heard Elder Bednar's talk, it was one more encouragement to me that, uh, no, in fact, uh, I should stay active and do many things of my own free will and not be commanded in all things, try to bring about uh, good things using what uh, gifts and background I have. So in, in one sense, it was a, I took it as a keep it up message, which may sound uh, self-serving, be that as it may. But on the other hand, it also made me think, it reminded me of the overarching purposes to keep in mind of the, that is, it is the good of the restored gospel that must be served. And we must think about how best to do that. You know, as much as anyone, I like uh, I, I prefer winning an argument to losing <laughs> one. And when I think I see something clearly, others have compl complained, and I acknowledge the point that I can seem very uh, confident, and maybe it seems that I'm taking taking pleasure in being right, which is uh, which is natural and human, and I probably won't suppress it altogether. <laughs> but uh, Elder Bednar reminds me, that what it's all about. It's really all about consecration and using what talents I have uh, to help out, uh, and that it must be done in a spirit of uh, love and brotherhood and charity without enmity, without contention, uh, avoiding contention. Uh, so I haven't always, uh, I don't think I have deliberately sought out contention, but Certainly, I might do more to avoid it. Or it, it it's always about trying to maximize the uh, proportion of light to heat, I think. <laughs> and I suppose, given human nature as it is, uh, not only mine, but those whom I engage, I don't imagine it'll ever be possible completely to uh, eliminate the heat that comes with the production sure. of light. But... Uh, Elder Bednar did help me to recommit to attending to that uh, ratio, you know, trying to produce more more light and less heat whenever possible. Hmm, interesting. So, I, and I, you kind of referenced this, and I don't mean to kind of put you in a box or anything like that, but you do represent what some people would place as a conservative tag on, on right. what you've written. And, of course, I use that term knowing that as a political science person, you, you – that, that term comes with a lot of baggage attached to it. So how would you classify yourself or at least your voice online? Well, I, uh, my relation to the uh, term conservative is one of acquiescence and resignation in some sense. I, uh, as you say, it, it comes with baggage and like all terms or really be beyond most terms when you get into the ideological area, I mean, the, 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 uh, the heat to light ratio tends right. to increase. Uh, so uh, I'm certainly not a liberal in the contemporary sense. My political opinions line up with uh, conservatism in many respects. It, it's a little frustrating because as soon as you 
as soon as you say it, as soon as I'm identified that way by a group of readers or by my students in the classroom, then there the temptation is to think, oh, I know what a conservative is, and I've already kind of dealt with that so or dismissed it are. or put it aside. And that's what you are, so you're already in a box. So that, that's kind of a, an occupational hazard. Um, I'm a certain kind of conservative, an, an intellectual conservative, whose conservatism is really grounded in a study of the history of political philosophy going back uh, to Plato and Aristotle mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Tocqueville is another one of my great references. I owe a lot to, owe a lot to Leo Strauss, whether or not I am a Straussian is another <laughs> one of these heat to light questions that can come up. So I, I'm, I'm kind of resigned to it. I, I don't mind, uh, in a way I feel honor bound uh, to embrace it uh, because people are trying to, some people would try to uh, make me pay for it and therefore I, I think I owe it to uh, the smarter and better conservatives not to break ranks with them just because somebody is trying to use the term to, uh, to minimize what I'm saying or to put me in a box. The political implications of Latter-day Saint teaching are a matter of legitimate debate and uncertain and cloudy around many edges. All that is worth uh, discussion. Latter-day Saint thought cannot be, must not be identified with any ideological persuasion, certainly not with any political party, North American or otherwise. Uh, that being said, the other extreme that uh, sophisticated thinkers tend to fall into when thinking about uh, religion and politics, about our religious beliefs in relation to political labels or, bo or boxes, the other extreme is to imagine that uh, our religious commitments can be completely indifferent or neutral with respect to the main political and ideological persuasions and forces that are out there. And how could we possibly think that's the case? Especially as political disagreements become a touch more and more fundamental issues, such as the family, and there we've already been talking quite a few minutes, and now this is the first time I've mentioned <laughs> that fundamental issue. And um, I suppose that politically, intellectually, in many ways, I, I regard this as a pivotal issue. And on that issue, how can I not be called a conservative? I certainly, I like to put the problem this way. Uh, just walk up to any reasonably informed person on the street. You can, you can pick a, a sentence almost at random from the church's uh, family proclamation and ask that person, is that a conservative or a liberal proposition? I, I don't think there's much mystery as to how that question is going to be answered. So I don't reduce everything to that, but that is a pivotal uh, question for me. I think the questions of family and sexuality are pivotal, critical. They are the, uh, it is at that kind of crossroads at which we stand. Yeah, it would be idle and pointless of me to try to deny that my point of view, like I would say that of the family proclamation, is much more resonant with the conservative side of the political divide at present. So speaking of terms or, or tags or maybe even social constructs, your article addresses several other token terms that are often used in the discourses that we see online, and even those especially critically of the church, um, these sorts of terms tend to be used uh, to leverage an argument but are often based on very different understandings. Right. So what are some of those terms that you single out in the article and, and why? Well, uh, so returning to the question of the, of the Mormon intellectual, the instinct seems to be irresistible in the media and in our culture more generally to associate the intellectual with the liberal, progressive side of an argument. Uh, those who understand progress or reform in terms of the ever greater conquests of a certain understanding of equality and a certain understanding of freedom or liberty. These notions of equality and freedom are really two sides of the same coin, you know, two dimensions of a, of a mindset and really of a, of a project for social transformation. 
that is deeply rooted in our intellectual and now uh, in our popular culture, to the point that many intellectuals and uh, many other literate people who are influenced by or influenced by intellectuals or hold them in respect, many people are hardly aware that there are other intellectual traditions than this uh, progressive egalitarian tradition. People are hardly aware that there are philosophical alternatives to this progressive egalitarian position. And in fact, I would go further that uh, the progressive egalitarian position is uh, deeply questionable philosophically and that uh, some of the smartest authors have questioned it uh, deeply over the years. So we tend to associate intellectual with reformist, egalitarian, progressive. I could add the word secular. But uh, I guess part of my mission in life is to uh, destabilize, to problematize. There's a fancy professor's <laughs> word for you. To, to problematize this uh, association. There are deep intellectual traditions and philosophical arguments that are critical of progressivism and that actually, I think, go much deeper and have much more solidity philosophically, intellectually. That's really, the, in a way, the, the, great, uh, the great trick of progressivism is to, uh, is to hide the ball of, final, of, of, of ultimate grounding or purpose by sort of deferring, ever deferring the question, what is progress? What is its end? What are, what are its purposes? Uh, what would be good? What would, what would be good about achieving this end? Or, or is the end even conceivable? Anyway, that's a longer discussion of, uh, of the uh, progressive deferral of the question of purpose and thus, and thus the question of its own justification. Progress towards what? Progress in view of what? In view of what view of human nature? In view of what uh, idea of human purposes? Progressivism tends to hide this ball, but it's, uh, it's very attractive because, in a way, it makes intellectual cachet all too easy. All one has to know is that, all one has to show is that one can be critical of current mores, customs, morality, traditional authorities. To be critical of what is, uh, what is given provides immediate entry into the elite cadre of those who are in advance of society, the, the avant-garde. You're in the club of smart people. The club of smart people. <laughs> uh, and what makes you smart is that you have little regard for, you might even have contempt for, what ordinary believers or ordinary citizens around you take to be foundational. Back to your article, uh, you address this idea that typical apologetics doesn't always seem to venture into matters of political discourse because the church itself declares political neutrality on a lot of issues. So perhaps we could blame a little of this on your day job, but your article seems to approach the idea of apologetics from a more cultural and political defense as opposed to to a doctrinal defense. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, that, there's nothing wrong with that, but let, let's back up a, a few steps here. Now, and I'm not saying that this is the only kind of apologetics. Sure. And I'm not even saying that it's necessarily the, the best in some ultimate sense or the most life-giving, the most faith-sustaining uh, for everyone. Uh, what I am saying is that there is a task here in the area of political apologetics. We could call it moral apologetics. We could call it, and maybe this is a more appealing and less uh, confrontational name to put on it, we could call it anti or non or anti-ideological apologetics. Whatever we call it, I think it manifestly has an important role to play precisely because the undermining of faith that tends to come from the influence of progressive intellectuals committed to a certain idea of equality as freedom and freedom as equality. The, 
the vulnerability of many members is precisely to this uh, ideological undermining of their faith and confidence in the church. As I may say in the article, uh, just to give you a concrete example of the phenomenon I've ta- I'm talking about, if you take a, a young, uh, young professional or academic or graduate student who is a believing Mormon, the fact that this young person believes that Joseph Smith, let's say, translated the Book of Mormon by the gift of God from actually existing gold plates can seem quite uh, odd, no doubt, to one's employers, uh, mentors, prospective employers, and so forth. But it might be, it would likely be uh, tolerated even as a charming uh, and harmless oddity. But the fact that one upholds a traditional idea of marriage as the, you know, what I would call the natural idea having to do with a man and woman and essentially linked to the function of procreation, the fact that you held such a belief as that could be extremely damaging to your education, to your career, and therefore to your whole idea of yourself. So yes, I don't, uh, I'm no doubt uh, liable to uh, overvaluing the importance of the kind of apologetics I want to contribute to. Maybe I stoke myself up more than is warranted in order to seize the task at hand and to contribute to the work. Uh, Nevertheless, I I really am convinced, and it it really seems to me unmistakable, that among all the things that make people uh, doubt that contribute to shaken faith syndrome, uh, this is uh, very important. It might be the most important thing. I mean, I have friends tell me of their friends who are falling away, not because of the historical issues, not because of, uh, you know, doctrinal challenges such as distinctive Mormon teachings about godhood or what have you, but because they have come to believe that a progressive understanding of political morality and morality more generally, is the true understanding, and therefore they think the church must be at best backward on the uh, deepest moral issues. Therefore, the need for what I call moral apologetics, anti-ideological apologetics, or more provocatively but not misleadingly, uh, political apologetics, because the, these are political, these are questions with large political stakes attached to them in the world in which we live. I want to give a quote from your article um, okay. that, that I find to be rather acute to many of the church who wonder how they may be able to more fully engage with what Elder Bednar talked about in his Education Week thing. Regarding this online dialogue, some people might even see it as a fray of sorts uh, mm-hmm. of, of ideas that are going around. But uh, here's the quote from the article. It says, Others may wish to support church teachings concerning morality and the family, but would rather do so privately, even silently, leaving such controversial matters to church authorities, conceding perhaps that reason has little to say in this area. This is a question that would require much further discussion. For now, I will only say that I think it is a big mistake to concede the title of rationality to the proponents of radical equality and freedom and thus implicitly abandon core moral principles and teachings concerning the family to the realm of some blind obedience, end quote. Do you find this mentality of avoidance where we're, we, we are reluctant to engage in these discussions online, is that a common thing that you've seen? It's as common as can be, isn't it? Uh, I mean, among, among lay people, understandably, who don't have the tools, who aren't practiced in uh, talking about these things, they see the united front of progressive intellectual morality and politics. And it naturally, it's pretty intimidating. It's reinforced by movies, by TV, by... People get shamed a lot. People get shamed by... by so, it's reinforced by so much. And, uh, you know, it's easy for me to say that that's like water off a duck's back to me because I've, you know, I've been talking about these things and reading authors... Uh, who see through these things and take the questions to much deeper levels for a long time. But certainly you can understand the uh, bewilderment, the reluctance, and the sense of uh, resourcelessness 
that uh, affects many people. But those are ordinary people. But even in uh, even the Mormon uh, intelligentsia, uh, even among Latter Day Saint scholars, very fine and learned and very faithful scholars who really do not share the progressive sympathies. Well, here uh, I inevitably risk uh, dramatizing my own position, but there aren't many who stand out for, for engaging these issues, are there? Other scholars have other priorities, other audiences to uh, cultivate, uh, other good things to accomplish uh, in their own ways, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't blame them. But, for example, there's good work to do by indulging the premises of progressives, even when they seem clearly to, to lead to conclusions at odds with essentials of our faith. Uh, I can see the point of indulging the, the, those premises for the sake of discussion and in order to show uh, charity and sympathy. A bridge, maybe. Uh, to, in order to to build or sustain a bridge, that is all more than a defensible uh, strategy, but it has its costs as well. All I'm saying is uh, as we adopt the strategy of reaching out to progressive Mormon intellectuals, keep the costs in mind. Uh, One of the costs is that you may be indulging them too much rather than doing the somewhat more unpleasant work of pointing out where their premises may be questionable and providing them materials that may help them question their premises. But beyond that, there is the problem uh, that I describe as moving the tent stakes. We, there's a lot to be said for a, a broad and inclusive tent. So I, I'm not for a narrow and contracted and defensive understanding of our faith or its intellectual implications, but all breadth has its limits. I mean, if uh, there has to be a tent, or it won't cover anyone, it won't shelter us, it won't give us shelter and structure. There has to be some definition. We can't simply accede to the demand, and, and some people make this demand in so many words. The demand that people be allowed to define Mormonism uh, just as they like, and each can define it according to his own uh, taste, inclinations, emotional demands, or what have you. Well, to that I just say, no, I don't think so. The, if, a, if religion has a point, then it must have a shape and definition. Uh, the boundaries can be fuzzy, and people at the margins ought to be more than tolerated. They ought to be loved and listened to. But if we're always moving the stakes over in one direction because we see progressive intellectuals and those affected by them leaving or getting shaky, every time we move the stakes over to include them, to stretch, to stretch the margins, to interject more doubt, to legitimize more diversity of opinion, every time we move the stake over, we're actually uprooting a stake on the other side and removing uh, the shelter from, for example, ordinary faithful members who need, as I think we all do, the the firmness and clarity of teachings at a certain level. So in our outreach to the intellectuals and their sympathizers, we can't forget, the term is political, but it is evocative, it's descriptive, we can't forget the base. The base matters. And to be sure... Our church leaders and general authorities uh, do much to, uh, to support and shore up and sustain the base. But my point is precisely that uh, if we do not lend our voices in the spirit of what uh, Elder Bednar and Elder Ballard and others have recommended regarding using the media and so forth, if we as people in education and writers, people who are lucky to be able to spend a lot of our time reading and thinking, if we do not lend our voices and demonstrate by our own words and actions that smartness and learning are not at odds with supporting the clearly reaffirmed teachings of our church leaders. If we don't do that, then our inaction speaks volumes. Volumes. It says 
intelligence is on the other side of the question. It reinforces the fear that we have only blind obedience on the side of orthodoxy, if you will. In, in many ways, your article is, is serving to be an invitation uh, or an extension of Elder Bednar's invitation, but it's an invitation nonetheless for others to, to join this kind of effort. So h- how is your article an invitation and how do people participate in what you're engaging here? Well, uh, first of all, the invitation is general and open-ended, and every reader or listener can take it as she or he hears it, namely, do good in the way you're suited to do good. Uh, If I've helped you to see a dimension of the problem that you might be able to help with, find ways to do that, Uh, read things that help you learn to articulate, to extend further uh, the bases of arguments that our church leaders have, have given to us or suggested to us. Do what you can. Uh, don't wait to be commanded in all things. Uh, do many good things of your own free will. I come back to Doctrine and Covenants 58. But uh, besides that, there is a more uh, particular uh, purpose I have in mind for any who might hear the call, and that is to uh, join an effort to uh, develop this largely missing side of apologetics or defending the faith or, if you will, simply explaining the faith, uh, articulating the faith in ways that make it intellectually more solid and satisfying and shareable. And it turns out that a a recent opportunity to do this, a particular opportunity has appeared, so I'm very happy to uh, share the news and uh, solicit uh, assistance. Uh, it would be wrong to, uh, to, to put people off gratuitously, but one has to, if there is a cost involved in a fruitful and important clarity, then one has to uh, count the cost and sometimes pay it, it seems to me. Meridian Magazine is, is one independent Mormon publication that has in no way followed the pattern of you know the slippery slope leftwards towards a stati- towards a stance of kind of a a dissidence or uh, a bracketing let's say of orthodox views on the other hand i know because i have uh, published a number of things in meridian magazine things that i'm proud of and i was happy to reach that audience but it's a it's a wide and non-academic audience for whom it would not be appropriate to enter into more developed philosophical discussions that would require references, and not necessarily footnotes, but referencing uh, academic debates and so forth. There is that limitation. And so my idea for the proctors was, what if there were a, a complement to Meridian, a spinoff from, or rather an appendage to Meridian that would seek to cultivate an audience of Mormon, I can say counter-intellectuals, faithful Mormon intellectuals, uh, not uh, beholden to the progressive orthodoxy. And uh, I was very encouraged to find that uh, they agreed and liked the idea, and so we're going forward. We're working on it. The page is going to be uh, called uh, the, the page or the tab or the link accessible from the front page of Meridian will be called expand after the wording in Alma 32. Uh, So the idea will be uh, certainly these moral apologetics that I've been describing will be prominent there, but more generally, faithful Mormon intellectual engagement with with broader intellectual trends, uh, engagement with the intellectual culture more broadly. In some ways, a, a kind of mediation between uh, the intellectual and artistic world that is out there, secular or including other religious voices, and engagement uh, with those uh, intellectual uh, traditions that are out there, but in a way that uh, mediates with uh, more Mormon thought and Mormon belief, provides a, a bridge in that sense, an alternative kind of access point to a large intellectual world, alternative that is to the progressive intellectual niche, which seems to be in a way 
the path of least resistance. So there it is, Meridian Expand. Uh, I've I've uh, sent out a shareable email to uh, scores of uh, friends, acquaintances who are uh, scholars and writers. But here with my voice, I send out the appeal once again. If you would like to help out as a writer, a recruiter, an editor, if you would like to help out in any way with this still nascent and somewhat inchoate project, uh, let me know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not only open to help, I'm open to uh, advice and counsel. Excellent. Okay. So is, is it going to Meridian, Meridian Magazine, that's where you want people to go initially, or is there a separate web address set up for this? Well, that the Meridian, we're, we're still preparing, uh, we're gathering a, a kind of pipeline of articles to prepare the launch at Meridian. Uh, in the meantime, people can just uh, contact me uh, via email, for example, at ralphhancock fifty one at gmail dot com, for example. Okay, that would be. I'm not hard to find one way or another. <laughs> the door is open. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, Ralph Hancock is a BYU professor in political science and is bravely engaging in a new project with Meridian Magazine that we've talked about into this moral apologetics. I encourage you to go check it out and to add your voice to it. Uh, we will have a link to this article for the posting of this episode at blog.fairmormon.org. Thank you again, Ralph Hancock. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for listening to this episode of Articles of Faith with your host, Nick Galetti. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org. Tune in each Monday for another episode of Articles of Faith. Thank you for listening.